Good morning, everyone. As you saw, Mark, Larry, and I are three men in black, or three amigos. <laughs> Last year, when I just arrived here, uh, can't even remember from where my luggage was lost, so I had to come with my shorts. And uh, Mark threatened me that he lost uh, half of his audience, and the other half were saying that uh, they would never, ever come back again. So he said, after all, you're going to talk to Dr. Brilliant today. So I woke up at 5, started to take all my smart pills. I mean, what, how do you prepare to go and interview somebody who has three PhDs but never finished his bachelor's? I mean, you just <laughs> tell me. <laughs> I've been pumping so many smart pills so that I would appear somewhat, somewhat intelligent in talking to this great, wonderful person. I've known Larry, let's see, the first time we met was uh, in a very interesting event. I was uh, having a tea time at Pebble Beach. <laughs> and uh, you know how difficult it is to get a tea time over there. And uh, I was looking for a partner because I was going to lose it or go with someone, and I couldn't find it. It was on 4th of July. So Larry overhears me and says, I will come and play with you. <laughs> I said, OK. And I took a look at him and said, OK. From everything I know about him and I have heard, he's great brains, he's great humanitarian, one of the most amazing people you have ever met in your life. He doesn't look like a golfer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our image of golfer is, Tiger Woods, you know, six foot something, and got uh, phenomenally fit, has got amazing uh, strokes, all of that. So we go to play golf. I'm a horrible golfer. He asked me, what is your score? I said, well, in um, normal courses, if I break 100, it's lucky, normally it's 105 or so. He says, well, in Pebble Beach, you better be ready to shoot around 110, 115. To make a long story short, I shot 125. Now, guess what he shot? Any guesses? 81. <laughs> so he is multi-talented in many different areas, many, many. And it's my pleasure to start to talk. Hi, Cameron. Hi, Larry. Nice knees. <laughs> I told you. What can I say? Oh, my god, look at that. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really nice to be back. I can see that you've changed the format. <laughs> you know, people used to come up here and be very serious and talk about really important things. OK, Dr. Brilliant. <clears throat> <laughs> I will try to cover my legs as much as I can. <laughs> All you ladies, please look the other way, OK? <laughs> <laughs> so Larry, uh, we are going to talk about the Google's programs on uh, rapid response to crisis. Could you tell us how did the idea come about and uh, how you guys, uh, I know you went through a significant process of, uh, for quite a while. Um, taking your time to come up with what sorts of activities uh, Google Foundation would do. So uh, tell us about the process and how did you decide and the specific uh, areas of uh, rapid response. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me back. It's really wonderful. I feel like fire is my home. It's the place that I would love to come every year. Uh, it's great to see old friends. Um, really wonderful for me to be back. Uh, so, so when I went to Google, um, the idea that uh, Larry and Sergey had was of creating an unconventional um, hybrid philanthropy, one that wasn't a 501c3, uh, but did a lot of the philanthropic things that uh, an, uh, a foundation would do, but had a structure that looked more like a C Corp or a line listing and, under Google. And that allowed us to do things like 
uh, buy companies, make investments, start industries, uh, and lobby, do things that a 501c3 cannot without difficulty do. And we went through a process that lasted uh, almost uh, 14 months, starting with thousands of ideas that people sent us on what we should work on. Many of my friends here at, at FIRE sent lots of ideas for us to work on. In fact, most of the people in FIRE who, who talked to me uh, sent me um, uh, suggestions that we work on the world water crisis, which was certainly one of the things we looked at. And we went through a process of trying to see what things uh, were of a scale that they could make a big difference, uh, but that Google might have something to do and add that wasn't just money. The engineers, the technology. Uh, otherwise, we're just a bag of money like everybody else. It might come in a different color, but it's still a bag of money. And one of the things, and, and the five areas that we uh, en ended up with was trying to find a technical solution, an engineering solution to climate change by investing, and we've announced that we'll be spending hundreds of millions of dollars to try to build our own um, renewable energy, electricity from renewable energy facility at a price less than coal. And our argument was, and Sidney Rittenberg is here, will tell you, because we talked about this two years ago, that until you can have in China a source of power, electricity, that's from renewable energy at a price less than coal, it, it, it's not going to be international pressure that changes the equation. It's the availability of low-cost renewable energy. And, um, and then India, where I lived for 10 years, will burn every lump of coal unless there is something cheaper. So we've really d devoted uh, a lot of engineering uh, interest and financial resources to this. Likewise, we're interested in electric cars and, renew and uh, rechargeable plug-ins, but, but only insofar as they can plug into a green grid. Um, and then um, uh, on economic development, an area that Cameron knows so very well and his wife, who's, who's a saint who works in so many of these disaster relief uh, areas herself, um, we're trying to work to improve public services, government services primarily, church services, NGO services for the very poor, the poorest in the world, particularly in areas like education, water, and health. And we're also trying to work in job creation uh, in Africa and in South India. So that, that brings us to our fifth initiative, which is the one you're asking about. Um, and I would say uh, even that I'd like to break into two parts. One is the emergency response to disasters, as we've seen in Myanmar and in China. And uh, I'm pleased that Google and um, our, our employees uh, have donated more than $4 million and got $4 million into the field, half into Myanmar and half into China in a matter of hours in some cases. Um, but, but that's only a, a short-term reactive mm -hmm. uh, response. The, the bigger question, I think, is really much more in tune with what FIRE is all about. Uh, my favorite part of FIRE are the five-minute uh, uh, visionary prophecies of what will happen in the future, and then Mark's uncanny ability to remind us the next year how wrong we were last year. <laughs> um, but, but what if you take that and you put that into a context of disasters, and I'm going to include pandemics and drought and famine and man's inhumanity to man and all the corollary issues of that, um, we need to be able to find ways to uh, detect crises early, respond effectively. We also need to be able to predict where they're most likely to occur. And if we take a step back even further, we need to be able to identify the hot spots, the places in time and geography that are most likely to cause these conflations. And um, in epidemiology, and I'll try to draw it, but, but we have an epidemic curve. And an epidemic curve looks just like a Gaussian curve does. And usually an epidemic begins with a few cases and then it uh, passes rapidly from person to person or water to person. And you get a big peak and then everybody who can be exposed has been exposed and the curve goes down. Um, but, but most epidemic curves are disingenuous. If a curve could lie, almost every curve lies because before the beginning of the number of cases detected, whether it's drought, whether it's a pandemic, there's many, many cases that are missed 
we don't see the first cases. We, you can't identify the first case of smallpox. No one can. You can only identify it when there's dozens of cases and you know that it's not chicken pox or scabies or something like that. So one of the things Google has been doing is putting a lot of effort into uh, early reporting systems, improving government services, public services, using um, electronic uh, systems like uh, GFIN, the Global Public Health Information Network, GORN, the Global Outbreak Response Network, uh, to go through and uh, create web crawlers to look all throughout any electronic media for any news of new or unknown diseases. That's one step to the left of the current epidemic curve. But we want to go more Can steps I to the left. Sure. Stop you for a second. So once you find that, then you have a system to notify the authorities within those hotspots of the trends, or uh, that hasn't happened right. yet? Right. This is a big issue, of course. Uh, I can't imagine uh, our CEO getting on television and saying we found a hidden case of SARS in China. I just don't think that would be a good <laughs> thing. Um, so we work with uh, WHO and UNICEF, uh, particularly with a group called uh, GORN, which is the Global Outbreak Response Network. And all, everything that we find, we turn over to CDC or we turn over to WHO. It shouldn't be a company that announces these things. And, and as we move forward, the systems that we build or fund or support will be public domain. Um, if you want to see one of them, there's a group called HealthMap, www.healthmap.org, which will show you at any given moment worldwide on a Google Earth or a Microsoft Earth platform um, every disease and every rumor of every disease. It's, it's very interesting how it clusters. Uh, but I do want to just mention one other thing, which is that um, in the last three decades, there have been 30 novel emerging communicable diseases. And you, you, you know many of them, but if I say them really quickly, if I say bird flu and SARS, Ebola, Lassa fever, Marburg, West Nile, Hantavirus, you know, you, Lyme disease, you keep thinking that these are all diseases which did not exist in human beings 30 years ago, most. Mm -hmm most poignant of which is HIV AIDS. Right. These are diseases of animals, and they have jumped species. And there is now um, a font, uh, a hotspot. There are actually two, there may be 10 hotspots, where animals are now uh, living in such close proximity to humans that these um, viruses are jumping species with increased regularity. In Africa, all along equatorial Africa, where many of these viruses have emerged, Africans consumed last year 600 million animals, wild animals, 2 billion kilograms of bushmeat. So we're funding a group of scientists who provide these hunters with a kit so when they um, kill an animal, they take a drop of blood from the animal, they take a drop of blood from themselves. Hmm. And then we test and we, we do a search for viral chatter this is a genomic surveillance system to see what viruses there are in animals that have not yet jumped but are likely to jump for, to humans. In uh, China and particularly in Laos and in Southeast Asia, um, almost every home in Laos, 85% I think, have chickens and pigs. And the chickens, pigs, and humans live in three stacks. And when you consume the pig, what's left of the pig, the entrails uh, are rendered, cut up, and fed to the chickens, and when you eat the chickens, the you same thing them. happens. So you, you've now got a, 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 a Machiavellian scientist could not have created better circumstances for the creation of new and novel pathogenic viruses. Humans and pigs and, uh, and chickens all sharing each other's uh, DNA and protein and viruses. So we've set up a system that we're funding with Rockefeller and uh, with Sam Nunn's group um, uh, in uh, these six country area, the Mekong River, where all these countries, including the health ministers of Burma and China, and poignantly so right now, have set up a joint surveillance system that we've funded so that they can find ways to share information about emerging diseases. Speaking of China and uh, Burma, Myanmar, uh, can you tell us uh, what you are doing uh, sure. in there and what has happened and uh, how far the progress has been, and especially in the case of Myanmar, the government lack of interest in dealing with uh, uh, foreign entities. Uh, how did you overcome that? Or maybe tell us 
each one separately? It's really difficult. Um, I, I, you know, I worked in the tsunami and I worked in the Bihar floods and the Ethiopian famine, and I can't recall, and I don't think anybody in the disaster community can recall a time when the greatest obstacle to getting uh, food in was the very people who have been uh, in power to, to support that process. It's very difficult and it's wrong and uh, there'll be a lot more to come after this. Let's just get through the uh, emergency. Um, well, we, uh, the benefit of having uh, about 18,000 passionate people at Google is that uh, you don't really need to be the first one to find out anything. You'll find out really quickly. I, um, I think I got about 500 emails from uh, Google employees uh, saying, what are you going to do about the, uh, the cyclone, um, the Nargis cyclone in Myanmar, uh, before I'd ever heard of it. That's how fast things moved. So we set up, um, you know, the Google homepage is sort of like, um, it's very sacred. And uh, it's very rare that we put anything on the homepage. Uh, and the last time we tried it was uh, for a HIV AIDS Day in December. And we linked the homepage to a bunch of uh, AIDS uh, activist group. And we, we brought them all down. <laughs> and then we brought our own homepage down. We almost brought down the whole, everything. Um, so this time we're, we were very careful and we set up a landing page. And then we pointed the homepage uh, to the landing page and we solicited uh, or allowed people to make donations just to the two organizations that we knew were already in the field, had people in the field, and could deliver money. It turned out to be Direct Relief and UNICEF. And uh, al almost without even uh, two days passing, we raised a million dollars. Then we announced we'd match that. Um, and then, we, then Googlers started making donations, uh, and then we announced we'd match that. And so we set up a committee. Uh, uh, we have several Burmese who actually work at Google, and we created a, a committee that looked at maybe three or four dozen different organizations. The Burmese who work at Google, not in Burma, but uh, in That's other correct. countries. That's correct. No, they work, they work in Mountain View, actually. We mm. actually have quite a few. Uh, so we, we just went through, and the criteria was, have they been working in Burma or Myanmar already? Do they have people in the field? Can we send them wire transfer of money? Can they get that money into the field? Because it still was possible at that time, and is today still possible, um, although there was a period when it wasn't, where you could go into uh, uh, Rangoon, Yangon, and buy goods. And then if you had boats, you could bring them to the periphery. Um, so we looked at that. Uh, and I'm just very proud of how many people in Google then looked at all the products that we have. Uh, very quickly, the whole Google Earth team started uh, acquiring high-resolution satellite imagery, putting that on Google Earth, putting tracks of the cyclone, putting that on Google Earth, showing where all the disaster relief organizations were and their phone numbers and their instant messaging numbers and how to connect them, putting that on Google Earth, and then trying also to uh, uh, just produce small uh, applications for people in the, uh, in the community who were in Bangkok because they weren't allowed in. Uh, they wrote applications like, how do I find my relative, missing persons register, rumor registers. So, um, so all of these are up and running? All these are up and running, in, for, and, and the same thing for China. Uh, yeah, let's talk about China. So. Sa same thing, almost exactly the same thing. It's, it's a, uh, these are twin mirror images of, of each other. The, the Chinese response uh, has been amazing. Uh, it's been extraordinarily effective and efficient. Um, and yet, the underlying cause of the tragedy is yet to ripple through uh, Chinese society. Um, but it, it, this is like a uh, um, this is like a body blow to China as it prepares for uh, uh, the Olympics. It has a very deep and powerful meaning in China. So we've been supporting. We have an office in China, and so it's been easier for us to do it from that office. But uh, I think uh, at last I saw, we had uh, almost six thousand. Google employees, that's out of 18,000, made personal donations for the um, relief in China. Uh, as you can imagine, the Google Foundation um, went through a significant vetting process uh, before they zeroed in on uh, Larry, uh, Dr. Brilliant, to uh, head that organization. Everybody and their uncle uh, was applying and was interested to lead such a phenomenal organization. Uh, so I asked the Google uh, uh, 
I guess, a nominating team about uh, what was their vetting process. And I think they forgot uh, one thing, so I'm going to ask him. We all have learned from the presidential politics that the most important issue is the pastor problem. So <laughs> tell us about your pastor problem. Who is your pastor? <laughs> uh, I don't think I have a pastor problem. I think I have a pastor opportunity. Uh, well, you know, I, th I, th I think uh, I lived in India for 10 years, and I lived in the Himalayas, and I lived in a... In a an ashram uh, in the Himalayas for two years, and uh, my guru uh, that I lived with uh, uh, turned out to have taught a lot of people that are fairly well known in the tech community. Steve Jobs lived in that ashram, and uh, Danny, Danny Goldman, who wrote Emotional Intelligence. So we, we don't have a problem. We're just really lucky that that we were there. Um, As you know, I was just joking. No, no, I know. I have the highest respect for that guru. No. So. Tell us uh, about I, I, how I, I, he... do, I do run visits back to the ashram. I took Larry Page and Jeff Skoll and most recently Mark Zuckerberg. So we're, we're trying to create a, uh, a Himalayan tech axis here. Wow. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, how that guru instructed you or inspired you to go and do something good in India and uh, maybe for a minute or two talk about sure. what the results of that were? Because this is an incredible story. Uh, well, uh, you know, I followed the usual career path in the 60s. Um, a bunch of Native Americans took over Alcatraz Island, so I joined them and delivered a baby. And then I, I played a young doctor in a, in, a, in a movie that Warner Brothers did. And we had a bunch of, it was about the Grateful Dead and the Jefferson Airplane. And then we took a bunch of buses and we went over to, to England and then painted a bunch of more buses, psychedelic colors, and drove through uh, your country, Iran, and Iraq, and Afghanistan, and I wound up in India, and I lived in a monastery, and that, that was the typical career path in the 60s. Everybody did exactly that, <laughs> right? Um, and then I was living in this uh, uh, monastery, and one day my guru came and said to me, you have to leave, and I thought it was because I was bad. It probably was. And he said, no, no, your destiny, like Yoda, he said, your destiny lies in another direction. And he sent me to go work for the UN. Uh, the problem is when I showed up to work at the United Nations office, I was still wearing a white dress. And they kicked me out. And I had hair down to the middle of my back. And I went up back 17 hours to the monastery. He said, did you get your job yet? And I laughed. And I said, it's not going to happen. He said, go back. I said, all right, I'll go back to him. He said, go back now. Anyway, I, I went back and forth uh, um, about a dozen times. And after being kicked out unceremoniously the first four or five times, I got smart and I got rid of the dress. And I started wearing uh, regular clothes and cutting my hair. And I wound up with a three-piece suit and a tie and short hair. And one day I walked into the World Health Organization office on at least my 12th or 13th time. And there was a tall... Uh, American there, which was unusual in those days. It was the Soviet uh, uh, form. In, Russians were bigger in India than Americans in those days. And um, the guy said to me, you look like an American. Um, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm a doctor. My guru in the Himalayas sent me here and said that I'm supposed to work to eradicate smallpox. Yeah, this is God's wish uh, and God's gift to humanity. What do you do? He said, well, I'm the head of the smallpox program. <laughs> and I've come in from uh, Geneva because the government of India won't let us have a smallpox program here. But, um, you know, if, we allow, if we're allowed in, I'll, don't call me, I'll call you. And uh, years later, after I was there 10 years, and I, I wound up running that program and I closed it up for WHO, uh, as I was doing the archives, I found his uh, interview note that he had done with me. And he said... I met this guy today, Larry Brilliant. He says he's a doctor. <laughs> uh, he seems to be a nice guy. Appears to have gone native. <laughs> <laughs> but tell us, what happened to smallpox? We haven't heard much over there. So what happened? Uh, well, we, we started off with uh, three people. I was hire number three, it turns out. Uh, uh, and uh, we, we, built a, we built a team that had 150,000 people. Uh, and to eradicate smallpox, you have to find every single virus in the world at the same time. 
and then put a ring of immunity around it so that the virus can't escape from a human and go to another human and on and on and on. Um, and uh, we had to visit every house in India and we did that every month for uh, 20 months. Uh, we wound up making uh, nearly two billion house calls. Uh, and in the end, after uh, three years, we did eradicate smallpox. And the last case of smallpox in nature was in Bangladesh on Bola Island, a little girl named Rahima Banu. Um, in fact, uh, in June, we're going to be having our 30th and a reunion of the smallpox teams to wow. get together. So I'm looking forward to that. So you're all going back there? And uh, we're actually going to cheat. We're going to do it in Geneva. In Geneva, yeah. wow. Wow, that would be a real event. Yeah. <laughs> Larry definitely has a flair for a lot of uh, different uh, fields. And uh, shall we also hear a little bit about Wavy Gravy and uh, I guess uh, Grateful Dead and all of sure. other parts? Sure. <laughs> I mean, I told you, he's a very, very colorful guy. And uh, if you want to see how popular he is, uh, last uh, year at the Clinton Global Initiative, we were in uh, this event together. And uh, every good looking lady who passed by, totally passed by all of us and goes and gives Larry a big hug and a kiss. And all of us who are standing there talking, we are all so jealous and whatever. And uh, I tried to make a joke. I said, well, are they being charitable? Would you like to say <laughs> <laughs> what your response to me was? <laughs> no, but I, I think with the shorts, you've got a better chance. <laughs> uh, we've just got a couple seconds, but I will mention that uh, the SEVA Foundation uh, that uh, has been working in 15 countries to try to get rid of unnecessary blindness. We'll be also having its 30th anniversary oh, wow. on September 27th uh, in Oakland in Northern California. And uh, we just heard that Neil Young will play. So it's Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, The Grateful Dead, what's left of the Jefferson Airplane, uh, Elvis Costello, Bonnie Raitt, uh, Jackson Brown. You all come. We'd love to have you. Mark, would you be able to forward the, the invitations uh, from Larry to all you of got us? It done. It sounds like a great event. <clears throat> well, okay. it's always a pleasure, my friends. Uh, we are all really uh, so indebted to him. Uh, those of us who have had a chance to hang around him, we all love him. He's one of the greatest people, greatest souls I've ever met. Thank you, Dr. Brilliant.